Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Destination Diversity, Ecosystems of the Peruvian Amazon and Andes, presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Francis Cassiapino. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Francis. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Rob, thank you so much for allowing me to uh, be once more with you this time. And thank you all who are right behind the screen uh, for your time, your patience, and for catching up with NetHub and these beautiful moments um, in which we can just come and reach you before you happen to come to this type of these nations. Well, um, as Rob already mentioned, today's topic, the one that I chose, um, I choose before was destination diversity because um, of a major feature, I think, I mean, Peru as a country is one of those special destinations that provides beautiful opportunities for, for our guests to enjoy not only flora, fauna, culture, but also an, an environment different microclimatic conditions that would just bring a, a beautiful add-up to the experience in general terms. So let me introduce myself. As Bob mentioned, this is me, Francis Casapino. I'm native from Peru. The picture of me right there on the screen is of me in my hometown right now, or one of my hometowns. I'm living now in Cusco. Been living there for around more than 35 years. But I come from a small native uh, town in the Sacred Valley of the Incas. Um, I'm a business I'm, and hospitality uh, university uh, graduate. I've been working in tourism for over 23 and some more years. And most of those years were just entirely being, I've been working for NetHub just by personal choice. It's a great company. So, uh, it's been an honor to be uh, working for NADHA for this long. Well, um, my background, of course, besides just studying many, many, various many topics in at university, was also just to get involved myself into some of the beautiful parts of my country. One of those is the Amazon rainforest. I've been working as a ranger at my young age. Go, I've gone deep into a very untouched part of the Amazon called Manu Biosphere. A, also, some of the experience that I had just drove me to uh, cover some of another part of the richness of Peru, which is its culture. No matter where you go to Peru, you always find pre ink and an ink insights. A, this was a place where there was so much uh, cultural development that then was expressed through its engineering as well and buildings. So a, I also spent some time at the Nazca National Reserve. Um, a, you must have heard about this place because it is one area in the desert of Peru, uh, south of Lima, the capital, where we have larger geoglyphs, drawings in the desert that were left by a culture, an earlier culture, 100, 200 years AD, to almost around 400 years, uh, I mean, to one 200 years BC to just around 400 years AD uh, that you can just clearly see on the left side of your screen. Well, I was really being blessed and happy to, to be with experts, even restoring some of these uh, big geoglyphs and have a beautiful experience of them. Well, most of my, my background also just came from really my passion over geology and flora and fauna, all together just with people. The social part of, of, the, of my society is so interesting as well. And, but this particular time, I'm just going to dedicate this uh, hour to show you what we can see in Peru when we are taking our guests to uh, to explore Machu Picchu as a, one of the destinations, and the other one is the Amazon rainforest. So a, we take a couple of trips 
to this destination. One of those is called Amazon and Machu Picchu and the other one Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. The first one is the one that combines these two worlds together. So exciting. So, of course, if you want to get deep into it, let me just show you this new slide. Yeah, no, this is not my kids just messing up with my map of Peru and painting and using their crayons all over the place. No, rather what you're looking at your screens, it's a, a, a drawing made by World Wildlife Fund, the organization that we work together with, a demonstrating 84 life zones that exist in Peru. Some years ago, World Wildlife Fund has described that in the entire world, we happen to find 104 life zones, environmental conditions, climatic conditions that creates a specific microclimatic environments. 80% of them apparently are just found in Peru. Those eight, that 80% is re, uh, represented by 84 life zones in such a small country. Peru is the third largest country in South America, yet is it still a, such a tiny country. If you just go uh, fly from the western side to the eastern side, from the left to the right, you would just cover no more than 1,000 miles. And you happen just to see 80% of the life zones that exist on Earth. So that's why I just chose a destination diversity as one of the major topics today. Well, let's get started with it. So uh, let me just also show you the map of my country, Peru. A, um, our, my territory is divided into four very well-defined regions. This is start from the left to the right. Of course, I ha we have the Pacific on the left side, uh, Pacific water. Then you can just see a very thin strip of bright yellow layer near the Pacific, that is the, the coast of Peru, that comprises for 11% of our territory. Then there's a brown reddish patch that runs north or south, right to the middle, up and down. That area, it's our mountain, our mountains in Peru, the Andes. That area comprises by 28% uh, of our territory and the remaining 61, it's composed by all this green land which uh, it's the Amazon basin. So uh, as you can clearly see, I mean, no matter where you are in Peru, if you just cut Peru uh, diagonally or just you make a transversal cut, you will just always find three major, in, along with the, with the Pacific coast, the four major uh, regions, very well-defined regions. Yet though, it's not as simple as it is. So. Uh, in order to show you how diverse and exciting this uh, destination is, let's just start talking about just first the coast of Peru. Well, in that regard, let me also show you that when we're just traveling in Peru, of course, we go from Lima, we go to Machu Picchu, and then we have to fly up just to Iquitos, the area on the northern part, which is where the Amazon is. Um, I should just start this very nice uh, webinar by showing you just a, a general map of the world. I would like you to focus on just what exists between those two red lines. A, uh, the red lines uh, were just drawn. Those are the Tropic of Cancer on the upper part and the Tropic of Capricorn. That means 23.5 degrees above the equator and 20. 3.5 degrees below the equator. This area in the world is considered to be, it is known to be the tropics as the tropics. So what it means, it means that it is a hot, very humid, and very rainy environment, just you know, naturally as, it, as it's supposed to be. But what happens when we are around Peru on this part, is the lower part, lower part of the equator. Well, a, uh, there are many factors that happen to affect or change or ultimately just be a blessing for Peru, Peru's environment. One of those is known as the 
humble current or the Peruvian current. It's a current that brings in, as you can clearly see in this map, uh, upwelling waters. That's called the Peruvian upwelling waters. That means cold, very nutrient-rich water that comes water, brings water a little bit from the Atlant uh, Antarctica and just uh, goes up along our Peruvian coast, Chilean, Northern Chilean and Peruvian coast. This cold water prevents rain from happening on the on this uh, Pacific Western side of Peru. So uh, as a result, of course, our coast is rather dry. If you ever just come to Lima, you will notice that by landing to Lima, Lima tends to be covered, our capital, by 800, I mean, eight months of the year, all covered in clouds. A, there is a lot of humidity. It's created by all that, um, you know, the heat of that tropical location, but it, there's not enough humidity to cause rain. Lima, it's known as the human, uh, humid desert. So having just a, a cold upwelling of water rich nutrients has just given rise to a major food chain of pretty much uh, zooplankton that is fed by uh, or it's fed on nutrients like nitrates and phosphates that are brought in by that humble current. As a result, the plankton um, that just you know feeds on these nutrients, I mean feeds now okay, uh, becomes the food for clams and fish and fish becomes a food for you know, countless of birds that exist on tiny little islands and islets that are located along the coast. So, a as an example, this is a beautiful picture I want to show you. Chile and Peru has the fisheries on the Pacific side as one of the most important industries in the in the territory, and all due to this very cold water rich upwelling brought in by the humble current. So the humble currents just moving from the, well, literally from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific of our coasts. So that's not only it. Everything changes when we have a phenomena that we, we call El Nino. This unusual phenomena, on the other hand, it's a result of the waters on the tropics in this central band being heated up. That is heated up uh, every two and, and seven years. It's just not, it's a very irregular pattern. But that heated water, surficial water, just comes to Peru, hits Ecuador on the north and the northern part of Peru uh, and just brings torrential rain to Peru. As it's bringing torrential rain to Peru, people in Washington could just be having a very severe winters. Or people in Australia, on the left side, and Indonesia and Asia could be facing droughts. So these are the humble current on the one hand, and these other unusual, irregular phenomena called Nino phenomena. It's just what also has created different microclimates that exist in this part of the world. So let me just also show you the map again, because of, of course, notice that we've been just talking about the Pacific side and everything that affects the Pacific. It also just creates a very dry coast, but despite dry, it just has some of the largest farming fields in, in, in all our territory. And this is very, very unusual because there's such a large territory and it seems that our farming activities are only located along that very thin strip of desert. Well, a, we're going to notice that the very cold, humble waters, as I was telling you, doesn't, doesn't create evaporation and therefore rainfall just to reach up the mountains. In that regard, of course, the mountains are going to become drier. But before we move into the Andes, let me just show you one other phenomenon that happened that started a little much earlier, 65 million years ago, and in different moments in their history, 23 million years ago, 10 million years ago, the Pacific continental oceanic crust usually just collides with the, with the South American crust. And that major collide along a fault line 
that, that it's known as a trench, uh, gave rise to the uplifting of the Andes. This major uplifting divided what at one time used to be just a almost level, regular, very regular flat environment from the Pacific side to the Atlantic side. A territory that didn't have many hills, except later on, if you come just to the coast, I mean, to on this trip, I'll be able just to share a lot more information on what went on on the Brazil, Brazilian side. But in general terms, it was a really, rather flat territory until the Andes mountain range started uplifting. So this major collide uh, and a subduction light created the longest fault line on Earth, which is right today, the Pacific side of South America, Central America, and North America which gives rise to the ring of fire. So this also, this major, uh, major orogeny, major creation of mountains, uh, played a very important role in how our territory from then on would look like. This is the type of uh, pretty much a slice of a cake when you just come to Peru and slice, slice it from, from the west to the east side. We have the coast of the lower part and we have mountains that were uplifted as high as today, 22, 23,000 feet. One time I mentioned to you, you are very proud of your 14 ers in the US. Well, we'll come to, to Peru and especially to Cusco, we'll show you our 19 ers just right across from you. So uh, the coast is where our big cities are located. We'll be flying to Cusco in the mountains. Machu Picchu, as you can see, it's on the other side, a little eastern side of the mountains on the lowlands, and ultimately the Amazon basin of our destination, Iquito, is farther low. So this is interesting because now we're going to talk about just these mountains in the middle and how it just happens to create different climatic conditions and environmental settings. Before we get there, of course, everyone assumes that the Andes is just one range of mountains, but not. Uh, if you just look at those these brown lines, this is the Andes. The Andes is divided into three different ranges, the Occidental near the Pacific, the Central, the one in the middle, and the Oriental or the Eastern ones a, that collide into different, what, what in geology is known as knobs. You know, there's a couple of knobs in Peru. So that creates such a wide and barren high elevation environment with plateaus and, and sometimes living areas above 10,000 or 11,000 feet. In this world and in this environment, the highlands of the Andes creates, or grassland as we call them, creates an environment that it's very typical from northern part of Peru and Ecuador and also Bolivia on the southern part. Higher elevation, too high, as you can see, above 13,800 feet just for, for plants and trees to grow. Yet though, we have one spe specific kind of tree that, that grows all the way up just to pretty much 14,800 feet, so creating the, the highest tree line on Earth. But in this environment, primarily composed by uh, grasses, as you can see, uh, it gives rise to a different type of life that we'll come to to talk about later on in a different in a different webinar. But here, it supports different animals such as vicunas, guanacos, llamas, and alpacas that roam on those on these plains. Another environment, another unusual special environment is the farming highlands. Well, check check at the elevation below 13,700 feet. My big question is, how many crops can you grow back in the States? 17, I mean, 13,000 feet or below 12,000 feet, you know, or 11,000 feet. None, seriously, none. And there are not many places in the world where you could just find farming fields at that elevation. Well, that's why Peru is known as a, as a mega diverse country. A, 
Of course, this is also one of the major gifts being left by our ancestors who dominated this harsh, high elevation territory and created and domesticated so many different kinds of products. A, this is another view of the same territory, farming highlands. High elevation areas where potatoes, lima beans, legumes, different type of oil roots are grown on patchwork. All these little green patches you see there are usually three and a half acres in size. That is how 70% of our farmland farming activity takes place here in the Andes. That's incredible. 70% of the farming activity, it's done by hand. No need for tractors. In fact, tractors would not be able just to drive up that is steep slope. It was had to be just done. Harvesting, growing and harvesting have to be done by hand. So uh, such, a, such an incredible place, such a cultural environment. There is no place in the Andes where you can come to find the hand of humans utilizing, transforming the place, turning them into herding environments or just farming fields like this. Well, the, the pictures that I showed you before, of course, are located at a very high elevation. As you could just notice, usually above 11,000 feet and going up to 13,700, 800 feet. But every now and then, we happen to stumble on a very low canyon. We, we in Peru call, we call them valleys. And this is rather a rare, rare type of valley. This is the sacred valley of the Incans. We tend to spend a couple of nights in the valley like this. Well, an elevation like this at 9,000 feet for us is considered sea level. I mean, we're Peruvians, we live high, and uh, 9,000 feet really is just provides the right conditions to grow fruits and vegetables and primarily corn. So uh, this is the lowlands in Peru. So um, this is also, it's an inter-Andean valley system, an environment that creates temperate, warmer climate, benefited sometimes by rain, but in most cases, indigenous people have been able just to utilize the streams and rivers and through an ingenious system of aqueducts and canals, they've been able just to turn them into fertile land. So this is one area that is, as the name says, inter in between the mountains, inter-Andean valleys. As the rivers are feeding these valleys, the rivers also on the valleys are plunging down towards the eastern side to finally get down to the Amazon basin. Let me just show you that. A, uh, we're going to go back just to this beautiful sketch because uh, now we're going to focus on the right side where the word Machu Picchu is and the word Iquitos is because we are already on the eastern flank of the Andes. This eastern flank gets benefited by a, uh, the Atlantic, the trade winds on the Atlantic side and the humidity from the Atlantic side usually comes to irrigate all that eastern slope of the Andes. So as a result, there is an environment that is known. Let me just show you through this map. This is the Andes that, of course, comes from Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, going down through Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and extends down all the way to Tierra del Fuego. But the portion of the Andes that is facing the eastern side, it's known as the tropical Andes or the green Andes. These are the mountains that trap and capture humidity and 78 inches of rainfall, around 45% humidity that comes in from the Atlantic side. Most of the rain, of course, is stay in the midst of the, of the Amazon basin, but some of it comes all the way up to the Andes. This very thin band creates that environment known as the humid mountain forest or the, the subtropical Andes. As you can just look through this picture, there is more clouds on the horizon. The mountains are still high, are rather plunging down to the Amazon basin. They've been worn out and washed out for thousands, well, millions of years after the uplift. Most of that good soil was just being deposited down at the bottom. 
that environment gave rise just to thicker vegetation, as you can see. Yet, I mean, with elfin and ground vegetation, ferns, mosses, herb plants just cover that environment. This is the, the environment typical to the area around Machu Picchu. So Machu Picchu is located right on the subtropical areas, just in this transition uh, zone between the high, barren, dry Andes and the lusher Amazon basin on the west, on the eastern side. So here's another picture of some of the bromeliads and how all that humidity that happens to come through the uh, from the Atlantic all the way just through the slopes of the lower lands of the Amazon basin just get caught up on all the branches giving rise to these beautiful orchids all over the place. Well, a, as you can just see, this is already high mountains, but then we start just plunging down to an area we also come to explore the vastness of the Amazon rainforest in South America. This is what we consider as lowlands, below 300 feet. So in this environment, as you can clearly see, there is just a tapestry of uh, canopy trees, high uh, emerging trees, strong, tall trees that cover the entire place as a big tapestry, green tapestry. This is an evergreen environment with only deciduous trees. In this environment, we had some areas that are known as seasonally flooded forests because as the Andes capture so much rain during the rainy season from November through April, all that water comes down the eastern slopes and it's just collected by all these rivers, tributaries, they are meandering their way through. This territory, a large extent of the territory on the northern part of the Amazon in Peru gets flooded. The water levels rise up to 50 to 60 feet from their normal levels. And they also just drop down in the, in the, in the dry season. So that gave rise to just smaller trees, trees that have adapted through roots and a, as you can see also in shoots, to just deal with this very high tides, seasonal high tides that uh, bless, not affect this environment with this water. So all the rich nutrient uh, waters are coming down from the mountains and feeding all this environment with these fantastic sediments. A picture, this picture will show you two of the very classic kinds of water that you'll come to see experience in the Amazon in the Amazon rainforest. The one on the black, yes, looks like a tasty delectable chocolate water, piece of water that we call them here the black water. The black water uh, origin, it's the interior of the Amazon basin and is the result of the decaying all the forest, the foliage, the roots, the vines, anything that falls down uh, seasonally just decomposes and creates a high pH acidic uh, type of, and poor also type of water a, that is called tannic water or humic water. So um, it's very interesting. And this type of water becomes just like, a, like glass mirrors that reflects just all this vegetation as mirrors. That's why that environment is called the mirrors, the, the, the Amazon of the mirrors. The water on the left side, this cafe au lait looking like water, has its origins in the mountains. All the sediments and erosion that comes seasonally due to the rain, rainy season in the mountains brings down all the sediments to the Amazon basin. So that is, that's the type of water that rises. That's the type of water that swells and, and, and also covers large extents of the Amazon basin. Bringing all these good sediments, indigenous people are able to use temporary uh, planting of some uh, vegetables, squashes, corn, peanuts on the banks of this, of this territory. Another interesting environment in the, in the midst of the Amazon basin 
it's known as terra firma forest. Well, meanwhile, a big chunk of the Amazon, a big portion of the Amazon is flooded uh, during the rainy season. There are also portions of the Amazon that have always been just on raised, high raised platforms. A, uh, they only just get water from rain. But as you can look just through these pictures, the Amazon forest is so thick and so dense, there is a, a very serious fight for sunlight that has driven all this vegetation, especially the taller trees, to cover as much space of the canopy to capture sunlight uh, that uh, they really, the soil down below at the bottom of all this forest is rather poor. The Amazon, this beautiful green environment you see, in biology, it's known as the green desert because there's only a very thin layer of soil, less than, less than a couple of inches thick uh, that is on the Amazon that if there is any nutrients, that's where you see it. The rest of them is poor acidic clay soil. So as a result, all this vegetation that grows on it brings up all this all these uh, toxics, toxins and alkaloids uh, in every plant. Well, life at the, at the bottom, uh, it's hard. All these little plants that start at the bottom have to try to make their way up to the top by piggybacking each other or strangling others. It's a almost 200 year, very silent fight that they have to face, all for the fight, for, for fight for light, sunlight. Well, in this environment, of course, with very poor soil and nutrients, to have the advantage of these extended batteries roots, it's, it's important, it's major. These batteries roots extend for several hundred feet away, interconnecting trees with others uh, and taking advantage also of the very poor nutrients that are scattered on the ground. So this is also very classic from the Amazon went on a tour. We happened to have to move, do some walks through the Amazon like this and again, get a great view of it and understand all this environment by ourselves. Another very interesting, uh, unusual, very diverse environment that I will come, will expose you to, it's known as the palm forest. Not every palm creates a forest. Here in, in, on the Amazon side, we have a specific palm called Mauritia flexuosa. It's a, um, a palm that provides uh, fruits and seeds that just brings in so many different kinds of animals living in this environment. This palm occupies territories that are flooded usually. And they are so used to it, they're used to dealing with the, the water that in, in other situations would just kill the plant by because exposing just too much water on it. A, this is a thriving vegetation that brings out monkeys, brings out macaws, because macaws make a nest out of all those trunks. When the plant dies, macaws tend to just use one of those dead stalks of trees as their as their, you know, uh, holiday inn. In this environment, as I was telling you, indigenous people, locals have been able to collect one of the fruits that they consider to be just very important. Aguaje, or palm fruit. Uh, moricha fruit, as the locals also call it. It's a fruit that is very rich in beta carotene, up to 10 times more than beta carotene, vitamin A than in any other thing that you can find in nature, whether carrots or sweet potatoes. Now, this is by far the best. So therefore, while it's also providing food for animals like monkeys and birds, it also just supports the livelihood of people who are living in the Amazon till these days. And one of the last ecosystems that we have in the Amazon is this one. It is called a shrub forest. 
their areas, usually just eddies or one time streams and rivers that were turned into oxbow lakes. That means they were cut off from their main source. The water is stagnant. It doesn't move just usually, or it just, it's being fed by rain. And that gave rise just to a newer vegetation, usually smaller trees, some grasses, some shrubs and bushes that cover the surrounding areas. In this um, bodies of water, when the season uh, definitely allows, we happen just to come to, to enjoy these beautiful flower, uh, water lilies that is very classic in the Amazon. I mean, you might have them in some botanical gardens, but there's nothing better than just looking at these water lilies really grow on their own in the midst of the Amazon basin. Well, as you could just see, in such a small place that uh, comprises the width of my country called Peru, we happen to go through so many diverse environments in nine days, 10 days of trip that just turns Peru a very exciting destination. So I just don't have anything else to say than just Whenever you are willing to come to Peru, just give us a call. We'll be here for you. Thank you so much. All right, Francis, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can and submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So, do we know which crops are grown in the small high elevation farms thank you for that question my friends um well uh, you, we happen just to drive through all those farming fields and sometimes if the opportunity allows interact with farmers and even just help them harvest some of what they what they grow so typically at that high elevation the staple crop is potatoes 2,700 species of potatoes grown. Each species dif differs from each other on every single plot, plot, so it's just beautiful. There's other different types of uh, tubers from the, in the Oxalis family, also that grows at that high elevation. Lima beans is another classic product. And every now and then, wheat and barley. Yeah, those would be just the staple crops that grows up there. Are there any coffee crops up there in high altitude? Oh, good, great call. I mean, no, that would be way too high, way too high. I mean, coffee definitely needs a subtropical environment, more humid, moist, uh, strong rainfall. And coffee does grow though in Peru and we have really good coffee. Um, uh, but it grows on the eastern slopes of the Andes in that band, green band that I was describing to you as the green Andes, so the tropical Andes. That's the area where we, we grow fruits and vegetables, especially subtropical fruits, coffee and chocolate. Great. Thank you, Francis. So uh, how big are the palm fruits? Are they like a date? Sorry, sorry, my friend, I couldn't, I couldn't get your question. How big are palm fruits? Oh, yeah. Oh, the palm fruits are rather only just a couple of inches big, you know, and perhaps inch and a half wide. There's not much flesh on it. Rather, uh, they are just covered by a scaly type of shell, very hard. You could not just peel it with your nails. Uh, you would just need to have a metal tool, a knife to, to scrape it, pretty much scrape it. Or as the locals do it, they soften them in water and then it, it gets easier just to scrape it off. Most of the fruits in the Amazon are, are just composed by a big nut, big shell with a very thin layer of flesh. And despite thin though, it, as, as in case of this palm fruit, it's very rich in nutrients. So what are some of the major wildlife we can find in the area? Yes, 
Thank you so much for asking that. This time, I just didn't want to cover the white light because uh, it would have been it would have been a little longer just to have a conversation over white light in every of these environments. But of course, we happen just to come to see llamas and alpacas in the highlands. We happen just to to see long tail rabbits. And if, if lucky, wild guinea pigs, as we're just touring around, and several birds at high elevation. In the area of Machu Picchu, we're just moving into the woody land of the, the spectacle bear, the Andean bear, and the Andean condor. In the inter valley, inter Andean valleys, we have the largest hummingbird in the world. It's an 8.1 inch wing expand hummingbird, a swift looking light bird. Uh, that is just the iconic one, but of course, you can easily just spot four or up to six hummingbirds just while touring right through, you know, the surrounding areas of our hotels. And then that's, that's in the mountains. Then in the Amazon, of course, that's such a big environment. When in the, in, the, in the Amazon, we're just looking for monkeys. That's one of highlights primarily. Uh, macaws would be just an incredible yellow, uh, blue and yellow macaws. Scarlet macaws as well. Uh, we're traveling along. We would be finding the iconic uh, animal of the waters in the Amazon. It's the pink dolphin. Inia geofrancis is one of species of dolphin that exists in Peru. And there's some subdivisions of this pink dolphin uh, on the Venezuelan side and on the Bolivian side too. But they only occupy the, in, the interior rivers of the Amazon basin. So what animals actually hunt alpacas and llamas? Do they have any predators they need to worry about? A, we, we do have pumas in the mountains, rather scarce and scattered, and foxes that would just hunt uh, the baby alpacas, you know, llamas. But um, no, in fact, they are not in the verge of extinction. Llamas and alpacas are domesticated at this stage, and we, of course, in, in this world, Peru is the place where we have the largest number of alpacas and the largest number of vicunas. It's a, it's a gazelle-looking like wild animal that has the finest fiber in the world a, that you can see on those grassland communities. But they are as domesticated, they are really in good numbers in Peru. So one of our guests recently read that there are parts of the Amazon that are now so low that it's really hard to travel to inland communities along the river. Do we know why that happens and is it still happening? Excellent. Well, wow, that's a beautiful question. That's an excellent question. Well, a, I was mentioning to you just at the beginning of our of my uh, presentation that uh, there is a phenomena that is called El Nino phenomena that brings in warm waters to this territory. That phenomena really creates major changes and sometimes messes up with what we consider the normal environment for all these places. Uh, El Nino can also affect the trade winds on the Atlantic side. And when the trade winds are just not bringing water to the Amazon, the water is taken somewhere else. And sometimes it just can be taken back into your territory, a, uh, causing floods, as, as what you had in New Orleans some years ago. That was the flooding in New Orleans was Amazonian water that never came up here. So um, this year we've been experiencing the, one of the worst droughts since the year 2010 in which, of course, there was not enough water coming, neither to the mountains, not even just to the Amazon. So therefore, I mean, the, the little creeks were just getting so dry and so low that uh, you couldn't navigate through them. They, that's right. Hopefully, though, I mean, I mean, right now in the Andes, which is starting with the rainy season and it's coming, coming strong too, I hope everything just comes back to normal. Our authorities in Peru say that El Nino phenomenon is not going to be as bad so far as, uh, as we expected because there is a, a tide, a typhoon that is uh, changing the course apparently just of El Nino and it's going to bring just the cold waters back to, to our Peru again. 
So is the Amazon in Peru still influenced by tides? The Amazon in Peru, uh, there's just only two environments in that evergreen world. We call it the high water season and the low water season. So that's that's the only thing that changes. Weather is the same, humidity is the same, 80 to 90 percent, rainfall up to 300 inches, seven feet all year long. But a, there is water that, that flows down from the mountains or from within the Amazon. So especially the water that comes down from the mountains a, really gives rise to these major rises a, of water levels up to 50 or 60 feet, as I was telling you before. And it's a cyclical pattern. Usually, that's that's really what keeps the Amazon alive. In fact, to tell you the truth, it's part of what it is. Yes. Great, Francis. Thank you for clarifying that. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for your closing comments. Oh, thank you so much, Rob, and thank you everyone just behind this screen for your time and your patience with me. I hope you were you were able to understand my broken my broken English. From here, I just want to invite you to come to Peru and see by yourself this beautiful and diverse uh, destination that we have prepared. It's such a beautiful and exciting experience, and when you just combine the Amazon and Machu Picchu together, you know you just it's a win-win trade. I mean, so. Um, from here, the bottom of my heart, I want to take advantage of this last second to wish you a, a fantastic, beautiful Christmas season and the best wishes for you all. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Francis, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please, Give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.